Um, I've had the privilege to spend some time with him, um, or some, a lot of time with him to some extent. And I can say that he is a good father, and you know he genuinely cares and, and just looks after her people. And that you know at, at the end of the day, that is his heart. So, Uncle Dave, let me pray for you, and then we'll hear what you have to say. So, Father, we thank you on this Father's Day for your love for us and for, for loving us so much that you allow us the privilege to have Dave Cape in our lives, Dave Anker. Thank you for the words that he has to speak, and we're excited to hear them. We love him. Thanks, John. Yeah. Lovely to see all the changes that have happened since we've been here. Can I just move this around a little bit? And I'll try not to stand on this. This is, it. This is interesting. Imagine trying to get on an airplane with us. <laughs> yeah, don't try. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. And uh, I was just saying to Carol, what a privilege it is for us. Um, uh, this is my first Father's Day in the 70s, wow. so um, okay. it's, a, it's a good experience. <laughs> 70 is a good way to start life. Yes, it is. Um, but I said to Carol, isn't it an honor that we have ministered on three continents in the last two months? Wow. And last Sunday morning we were bringing a church into Church of the Nations in London, uh -huh. and it was wild. <laughs> I, you know, we've always said in, in cotton, we won't all look the same. Well, trust me, this didn't look the same. <laughs> this looked like something that they just brought in from the West End. I mean, the worship, they were, they were doing the moves, and they had the guy on the end, who, a guy by the name of Israel in the church, he's a professional dancer, and he's dancing on the West End, doing the, the Michael Jackson moonwalk thing. <laughs> and um, I just said to the rest of the church, I was quite glad that they actually didn't get paid for their dancing, uh, that there was only one in the church who did. So, um, But it's good to be here, lovely to see the, the, the facelift here is coming to an end. It was kind of still getting going when we were last here. So it's lovely to be back. We're back for several months and we're looking forward to that. We have our daughter Karen coming next week. She's gonna spend a few weeks with us. We're gonna take a little time out when she's here. But it really is wonderful and it's, uh, it's a joy to be here on this Father's Day. I just wanted to tell you a little story about four guys who um, were in the, this becoming a father. This is not for the faint-hearted. Um, the, these four guys were in, the, uh, in the, the waiting room at the hospital. Their wives had all just had babies, and the nurse comes out and says to the first guy, congratulations, you are a father of twins. And with that, he says, man, that's odd. The man answers, he says, I work at uh, Minnesota Twins. Hmm. Says, the nurse says to the second guy, congratulations, you are the father of triplets. He says, that's weird. He says, I work for the 3M company. <laughs> the nurse says to the fourth, the, the third guy, congratulations, you're the father of quadruplets. He says, man, that, he says, that's amazing. I work for the Four Seasons. <laughs> and then there's the last guy banging his head on the table and he does on his friends. She says, what's the problem? What's the problem? He says, I work for 7-Up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, this becoming a father can be a tough business. But it really is such a joy to be here. Just recently we all watched the, um, we watched the passing of Billy Graham. And it was just interesting to watch his memorial on TV. And the thing that struck me most was the, uh, apart from the outpouring of, of the honor of public love and, and all of that that was around it, it was rather his children and his grandchildren. Their deep respect and their honor and their love for him just blew me away. It wasn't so much about what he'd done or what he'd achieved, but who he was, Papa Billy. And it just how they honored him in that way. And that's what we are sadly too short of in society today. A few years ago, we used to sing blessing and honor, glory and power to our heavenly father. And yet that should translate to earthly fathers as well. But sadly, we've come to the place where we fail to realize that it begins with those earthly fathers as well. I want to say that it's a, multicultural, multi-generational thing, did the famous American family, that we see a, an incredible example of multi-generationalism that began before the famous one at the back. Mm -hmm. It began with his dad in the front, mm -hmm. and it continues through the little guy who's now a big guy, he's actually quite chubby today. Mm -hmm. But the 
thing is this, it, it's a multi-generational thing, and it's a spirit of mutual honoring and respect. Carol and I had a clustered time in Devon in England recently. And we had a, a wonderful young girl who's a, a prominent girl in Church of the Nations sharing a message there. And she comes from a situation where her family was totally disrupted. Her dad uh, was an elder in the church, totally backslid and went wrong. And her parents landed up getting divorced. But she stood there and she honored her mother and her father. She said, I'm a product of my parents. I thank God for the values they put into my life. I thank God for the principles that I'm walking today that my parents instilled in me. And she stood there. She could have been bitter. She could have been hurt. She could have been twisted. She stood and honored her mom and dad. And she said, even when I'm stuck, I call my dad now and he gives me good, solid <coughs> advice. She's a married woman with three children. And I want to say it's a multi-generational thing and it starts with, with honoring. It works up and down and it never ends. It goes up and it comes down and it goes up and it comes down. I love it. I love it because think of lunch today. All the lunches that are going to be, and I know, just bear with me because I know that you're all wanting to go to lunch. <laughs> but at lunch today, you could have grandpa. And grandpa's son will be there. And grandpa's son is a dad too. And then his son will be there as well. And he's a dad too. So you could have three generations of honoring upward and you could have four generations honoring downward because it's an up and down thing and it's a multi-generational thing and it's God's design because of the Hebrew model. Think of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It went up and it went down. And Jacob had 12 sons and they became the 12 tribes of Israel because there was an honor. And if you go through God's word, you'll see he speaks out his love and his honor for each of those sons. What a joy. What a wonderful thing it is because, as I said, if you look in God's Word, it's rich with that. There was this guy by the name of Balaz who met this widow by the name of Ruth. And they had a little boy by the name of Obed, who had a little boy by the name of Jesse, who had a little boy by the name of David, that went down through the Messianic bloodline, and there was this honor of up and down. And you and I sit here today as a result of that. Blessing and honor. What a wonderful thing. I remember when I was, for those of you who don't know, I have walked on the, and worked on the streets of 33 nations. John said he spent time with me. We walked through Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And the Palestinians were getting quite excited at that time. But it was such an honor. And I have had the joy of walking on these streets. And when we first started and God called me to make a prophetic statement of the servant love of Jesus, uh, there was a lot of things happening around us and a, a lot of things that were quite flattering that, in the natural. But one of the things that I do at the beginning of each year, I try to go away and I lock myself up with the Lord. And I ask God to show me about myself. And I lay myself bare before God. And I ask God to show me those things that he would have for me to do. And the one time I was waiting on God and I was talking to him about his fatherhood. And he said to me, my kids were young teenagers at the time. He said to me, don't think that because you're a father that you're not a son anymore. And he began to peel me like an onion. And I realized that I needed to honor my mother and my father in a far better way than I had been doing. I was in my 40s. And I was established in my ministry. I was being used by God. And God said to me, but what kind of son are you? So I came home and I said to Carol after I, my prayer time was up. I came home and I said, God wants us to honor my mom and dad in a new way. Now, we lived a thousand miles away from them. But the Lord said to me, bring your parents down here every Christmas season for a month. Bring them down at your expense and honor them. 
in the best way you can. So I called my children, they were at university at the time in college, and I said to them, this is what we're gonna do with mom and dad. I said, we're gonna bring them down, we flew them down, we put them in the best seats in the airplane we could get. When we got there, we found a car and we dedicated the car to them. We said, you can use this car, it's at your disposal. When the tank gets empty, come to us, we'll fill it up. We made the room look like the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> Carol jazzed this room up with flowers and notes and gifts and presents, and they lived in the lap of luxury. We put a schedule out that one, we, we, we co-opted the other grandchildren that weren't out. And we got a schedule that one of the grandchildren would take them out to lunch every day when they were, when they were around. And we honored them in every way possible. And we spoke honor and we spoke love and we treated them with dignity and respect. And I think God calls us to do that. You see, the blessings of the fathers will be visited on the children yeah. to the next generation. Joseph honored his father and carried his bones back to the place that his father longed to be buried. There was a, there was a generational posterity in the honoring even when dad wasn't around. And I mean, that's quite a big deal. Eh? Imagine carrying your dad's bones through the desert just to get it back. You know, we think that we go on a romantic evening to the end of the Flagler Pier and we throw a few ashes off and we're honoring dad. No, this is carrying dad through the desert in a little box. Amazing. But listen to this. Uh, this story has a, before that, there was something else that happened. You, you know the story of Joseph and his brothers and how they came to meet him and what have you. And after they'd encountered him, he was sending them back to go and visit Dad. Back to Dad. And we pick up in Genesis 45 and 24. So he's giving his brothers a good word as he goes. So he sent them on, uh, he sent his brothers away. And they departed, and he said to them, Do not quarrel on the journey. Because he knew that they were prone to quarreling, and he went wrong. Then, he went up to the, then they went up to Egypt, and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and indeed he's the ruler over all the land of Egypt. But he was stunned, and he did not believe them. And when they told him all the words that Joseph had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father was revived. Then Israel said, It is enough. My son Joseph is alive. I will go and see him before I die. Again, that was quite a big deal because it's not just easy for him to go and see him before he dies. He had to, probably couldn't walk. He had to get on a donkey. And you know, when you're in your 80s or your 90s and you've got to get on a donkey, and start going through the desert it's not that easy but i want to say this to you honor and mutual respect is the currency of the kingdom honor and mutual respect is the currency of the kingdom i want to say to you today if we can catch nothing else let's catch honor and mutual respect within who we are they say that people will forget what you said they may even forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. It's that place of honor. We are so interdependent in our love and honoring. Do you notice what the word said? If you can just back up to that scripture again, if you don't mind. Thanks. It says over there, it says, jo Jacob revived when he saw that. When he heard of the success and the delight of his son, he revived. And we need to honor that that delight that we want to see the success of our offspring and vice versa that our, our offspring want to see our success and what we uh, what we want when we share the dignity of the father's approval note that it says that he saw the wagons that joseph had sent to carry him just go back to that scripture again look over there it says that he saw the wagons that he'd sent to carry him now let me tell you these wagons were no ordinary wagons these wagons were the Mercedes-Benz, the Jaguars, and the Maseratis of the day. When he saw the wagons, he knew that there was a delight that he could delight in the success of his son. And mutual respect is an amazing thing 
when it starts to happen and you see your children growing and you wonder who they are and how they're doing and all of a sudden you see that mutual respect kick in. Some of you know that um, several years ago I went to the tsunami in Sri Lanka <laughs> and it was an amazing mess, the, the Sri Lanka uh, tsunami and what transpired there and and then it got to the place where I came back and I had contracted um, a sleeping sickness, a disease. And I slept for about five or six months, 18 hours a day. I could not wake up. No matter, I was desperate. No matter what I did, I could not wake up. <laughs> and so it got to the place where um, eventually I... Um, was coming out of the sleeping sickness and I thought I was getting better and you all know John Scoltz, he's the apostolic covering of the church here now and John was a, had been a medical doctor and I was chatting to him and I said to him, <clears throat> John I think it's time for me to start moving again because I couldn't preach and I was bound not to preach and, and all of those kind of things. He said to me, um, Dave I, I think you should just hold on a little longer. And I said to him, are you sure? And he said, yes. I said, well, will you pray about it? And he said, yes. And this was on the Saturday. He called me on the Monday. He said, Dave, you asked me to pray. I've been praying. And I thought, that was quite quick. You know, I mean, I was waiting for him to pray for two weeks and then come back to God's <laughs> word. And he says, God says, a little longer. You need to take longer. And I was kind of frustrated, but I kind of thought, well, that's strange. But two days later, I had a heart attack. So I realized that John was hearing God. But I remember what happened when I had the heart attack. I, I just knew something odd had happened to me and I'd had a bad turn. And Carol was quite desperate and she was calling the kids and what have you. And my son Ron is a very gentle, he's like his mom, he's a gentle guy. And I remember lying on my bed that afternoon because I was feeling a bit flat. And I saw Ron stand over me. Now he's, he, he's very gentle. He's a very gentle guy. And I saw him looking down at me and he said, Dad, get up. No arguments. Get up. I'm taking you to the hospital. And I thought, wow. That's assertive. Particularly from a gentle guy. But I realized that as he took me with incredible dignity, he was respecting me and honoring me because he wanted God's best for me. And he took me to the hospital. At that point, I still didn't know that I'd had the heart attack. It was only when he got me to the hospital that I realized that I had, in fact, had the heart attack. But your children come to the place where they honor you and they bless you. I mentioned this is my first birthday as a 70-year-old. I had my 70th birthday a few months back. And it was a wonderful thing. But there was a thing when we had this lovely dinner. Carol had given me a surprise dinner. And a lot of my old friends of 30 and 40 years ago came. But one of the, the highlight of the whole evening was this picture, if you can bring that up. That's my son and my daughter. With my cross and bowl, which they'd smuggled into the event, and I didn't know. And they were washing my You see, honoring goes up and down. He's a dad himself now. He has a teenage daughter, and he has two little ones with us. And you're getting it way ahead of you. <laughs> but that is the honor and the respect that goes up and down. Now, we can move on to the next one, which is a trick question. Does anybody know who these two men are? Let me tell you. They're both very well-known men. It's a son and a father. The old man is a guy by the name of John Osteen. Yeah. Oh. And the young man is his son, Joel, okay. yeah. who you all know. Yeah. Joel is probably the most recognizable preacher in America today. But the amazing thing is most people know Joel, and he was obviously very young then. Not a lot of people know John. John was a great man of faith. John was a man on the cutting edge. John was a man who paid the price. You will almost never hear Joel preach without honoring his dad. It's an up and down thing. 
Joel has far superseded anything that his father ever had. His dad had a, a very large church of 5,000 people when he died. Joel's church is close to 50,000 people. But he will always bring honor and respect to his dad. Because it's a mutual respect thing and it's an honoring thing. We need to create an environment of honor. It's an art that we've largely lost in this day and age. So much so that society has become trashy and disrespectful. We need to come back to the place where someone who disagrees with us or our point of view is not our enemy. You've looked at the theme of these three gentlemen in the corner here today. And you may have different feelings on it. But the old man, Martin Luther Sr., said this. He said, I cannot hate any man, even after his son had been assassinated. He obviously instilled that in his children and his grandchildren. Because Martin Luther Jr. said this, I've decided to stick with love. Hate is too difficult a burden to carry. What an incredible thing. May we be like that in our family, in our home. May my children cry out with that in their hearts. May they say that they saw their dad love and refuse to hate because of what he saw. We've seen things in our lives that could harden our hearts. But you know what? We choose, we choose a tender heart because that's what Jesus had. That's what the Heavenly Father had. We need to bring, we need to respect the opinions of our fathers even though they may not have the tech savviness of our younger generation. They have the advantage of the mileage of the journey and the wisdom. <laughs> Again, if we familiarize, we equalize, and if we equalize, we neutralize. There's a huge church in South Africa called Rema. The pastor's Rema Corley. It's a large church. It's got about 30,000 people. And they have all the glitz and glamour and that that goes with the big church. But one day he called an old man at a conference that day. <coughs> the old man, none of us had really heard of. His name was Pastor Burke. He said, today I want to issue a certificate and give a gift of lifetime achievement and award to Pastor Burke. He mentored, he, he mentored about 300 pastors in Mozambique, raised them up, schooled them, and educated them. He translated the first Bible into Zulu, and most of you don't even know him. So today we want to salute him. He's 95 years old, and he still preaches the word. That's about honor. That's about blessing. I told that story in California in the large church I was preaching in there one time. And after the service, a woman came up to me and she said, you know, you spoke about Pastor Burke? I said, yes. She said, he's my dad. <laughs> I didn't know she was there. I just happened to tell that story. And then there are spiritual sons too. If you look at 1 Peter 5.13, it says, She who is Babylon chosen together with you, sends greetings, and so does my son Mark. Now that Babylon was not Babylon as in Babylon that we know. That Babylon was the code name that the early Christians uh, used for Rome when they used to write, because the epistle that, that Peter was writing from, he wrote in Rome, and that was the church in, in Babylon, which was actually the church in Rome. But he talks about my son Mark, with great affection. This is Peter the Apostle that walked with Jesus. And the reality is, John Mark was so loved that he was referred to as a son by two notable fathers, basically Barnabas, who was Paul's fellow apostle, and Peter as well. What a wonderful privilege the two giants of the faith would call you their son, which shows the incredible place of his heart. But the reality is, John... Uh, Spiritual fathers contend for their spiritual sons. There was a time, and some of you know the story, but it's worth repeating. When, when Mark had not done so well on a ministry trip, in fact he came in. Paul and Barnabas had a serious disagreement over this and went their separate ways over this issue. 
But Barnabas contended so much for that spiritual son and brought him through and redeemed him and restored him that even at the end, he wants Paul's heart back again. That we wouldn't have had the book of Mark today in the Bible because that's the same John Mark that wrote the book of Mark. So we need to be gentle and content for our spiritual sons because they may yet establish a major pillar in God's kingdom. And if you're a spiritual son and you feel like you've been rejected or abused, firstly, let me apologize to you. But secondly, let me tell you that there's a wealth within you. There's a deposit of the Lord within you. And greater things than these that, than he did will we see for ourselves. Fathers contend for their son's salvation as well. Look at Joseph. He took, he took Jesus off to Egypt. Strange thing that the people had escaped from Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod, we see in Matthew chapter 2. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I will call my son. Now there's a double meaning to that, out of Egypt, because Jesus came out of Egypt in that way, but since the fall of man, all of us have been landed in Egypt as we were born. We've all had to come out in God's measure of salvation to be regenerated to the purposes of who God wanted us to be. And the word goes on to say that we, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Since the fall of man, we all need to be saved by grace. Sometimes that contending comes in the form of tough love. Dads are not just horrible, dads contend for their sons. I have a, a pastor friend in Port Elizabeth. <coughs> wonderful man, wonderful dad. He was the dad who was at the soccer match every Wednesday afternoon when his kids were playing. He was the dad that would take his sons hiking during the holidays. He was the dad that would sit down and do homework with his kids. And his oldest son went into rebellion. To the point that it was indescribable. He was into drugs. He was into everything you can think of. Drink, alcohol, living around, whatever he was doing. And the son was a minor. He was still a teenager. This dad loved family so much that he'd even, even written a book about parenting. You talk about, you know, you write about it, you'll walk it. He, he, he walked it. And eventually they landed up before a judge one day. Because my pastor friend had said, if this son wants to come to our house, he needs to make an appointment. He can't just walk in and abuse his mother, walk in and out, live like he likes, do what he likes. <laughs> and the judge called the pastor forward, the respected pastor. He said, you're a pastor and you're supposed to live by grace. How can you treat your son like this? And he said, you know, before God, my son knows we have godly values in our home. And we abide by those godly values, and we love our son. But for his own good, he can't just do what he likes, because we have a standard and God's rules in our home. And we love him, and the day that he can live by those standards, he's very welcome. And this standoff was awkward and it was very difficult. And nobody quite knew what, how to handle it. <clears throat> Until the day came. One Sunday morning like this, his dad was preaching like I am now. And this young man came. And he walked slow down the aisle of the church. And he got down and he fell on his knees and he wept. And he stood up and he said to the church, I've sinned before God, I've sinned before my parents, and I've sinned before all of you. I want you to forgive me. I choose to repent. And he turned around, and today he pastors a church in Cape Town. Because God is a full, redeeming, heavenly Father who loves us. Now, I'm coming into land. <laughs> We don't have land, but I'm going to tell you a story about an airplane. <laughs> Sometimes we just need dads. There's a lovely little story that I found 
by the name of Ken Lockridge in New Mexico. He writes this little story. He says the, the Cessna had just cleared the pattern in the climb to 1,500 feet when my father said, it's okay, you can land now. My newly minted private pilot's license in hand. I'd wanted him to be my first non-instructor passenger. I'd planned to circle the Michigan State University campus and then come back to the university-owned airport. I reminded him of that recently, and I'll never forget what Dad said. More than 40 years ago, he said this. He said, I'm not fond of small planes. I just wanted you to know I had confidence. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just need Dad's approval. And I figure it's probably the same with Father God. Mm -hmm. In the book of John, we sang this morning about Son of God, Son of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Son of God. Father God said this in Matthew chapter 3. He said, this is my beloved son. He said that on a couple of occasions. If earthly fathers can delight in their children, how much more, Father God, have you ever wondered about Father's recognition, Father God's recognition, and if Jesus actually needed it? I suspect he did. Because he sat down and he said, I only do the things I see the Father that's a deep desire for Father's approval. Have you thought about when we pray, Thy kingdom come? Have you ever wondered about praying that prayer? We love kingdom and we preach about it and we long for it to come to earth. But earth is a mirror, mirror, mirror of Heavenly Father's kingdom. And so we're inviting God to allow us to reflect His kingdom here on earth. How good are we Do you remember Jim Elliott worked with Ecuador with the Uchinua Indian tribe who was murdered by the primitive people? And after his death, his wife continued to work there and he said this. He said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. We've got nothing to lose by giving us. To be able to gain that which we hold in eternity. Years later, subsequent missionaries went on and told the story of Jesus to the, and the gospel to this tribe. And their response was, we know this man. He lived among us. There's a similar story about William Le Wesley. Uh, William Leslie. In 1912, he was a medical doctor and he went to minister to the tribal people in the remote part of the Congo. 17 years after his return to the U.S., he was a discouraged man, believed that he failed to have any impact for Christ, and he died nine years later. Wesley would on occasion cross the river once a year. He'd cross the, the river and <coughs> go, and he'd begin to teach the children to write and to read. But in 2010, a team led by a man by the name of Eric Ramsey and another guy by the name of Tim Cox from World Ministries made an amazing and sensational discovery. In a small plane, Ramsey and his team flew from Kinshasa to Vanga. And after they'd reached the Vanga, they hiked a mile to the Quilu River. And they used dugout canoes to cross the, the, the river half mile. And then they hiked 10 kilometers into the into the jungle with backpacks and before they reached the Yancey people. They were unprepared for the remarkable find. They found a network of reproducing churches hidden like glittering diamonds in the dense jungle of the Quilu River from Banga, where Dr. Leslie had been stationed. There were 34 vibrant churches in eight villages with no Bible in the Yancey language. Sometimes we just need Father God's approval. And it's the same with us. When we begin to reflect and to mirror Father God on earth, people will, who live with us and work with us will begin to say, he or she lived here among us. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So there we have it. We have a wonderful Heavenly Father who longs for us and yearns for earthly fathers to be the same, to honor and respect because they reflect him so well.
Let us rise up once again and live our lives to reflect blessing and honor wherever we are. God bless you. Happy Father's Day to the whole family, to the moms, the dads, the children. May you be blessed up and down. Blessing and honor. It's an honor. God bless you. Let us pray. So, Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you. We thank you for your love and your goodness. We thank you, Father God, that you became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you displayed fatherhood, that you gave us the pattern. And I want to say this on this Father's Day. If you've come and you've never given your heart to Jesus, don't go home without Jesus today. It doesn't matter whether you're a father who is just 26 or 66. We are all God's children. And you might say, well, Dave, I've lived this right life. I've lived away. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. <coughs> Jesus died, and he said you must be born again. It doesn't matter if you've been in church all your life. Jesus said you must be born again. And Jesus said this, he says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Many people have believed in their hearts, they've never confessed with their mouths. And so if that's you today and you want to say yes, they pray for me. I'd love you just to raise your hand, I'd love to shake your hand. Let me tell you a lovely thing, God isn't a God of chance. Last Sunday morning, we were in this poor part of London, and I was preaching, and I asked the same thing. The word said... I just felt something said to me, don't, don't ask this morning. Everyone here is saved. And, and, and the Holy Spirit said to me, ask. And while I was preaching, a young man had walked in off the street. Amen. And he gave his heart to Jesus. Amen. And so if that's you and you here today, and you've never given your heart to Jesus, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Why don't you just pop your hand up if you want to say, yes, Dave, I'd love to receive Jesus today. I'd love to shake your hand. What a wonderful thing to receive Jesus on Father's Day. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So if that's you here, why don't you just pop your hand up quickly. Is there anyone here who'd love to give their heart to Jesus today? Anyone? Is that you, man, who's putting your hand up? Okay, that's wonderful. So why don't you just remain standing? Anyone else? Okay, well, that's wonderful. Let me just pray for you. I want to tell you that the whole, just stay where you are, that's it. The whole of heaven is rejoicing over you today. Thank you, Jesus. I want to say this, what is your name? Andrea. Andrea, the Bible says that when one sinner repents, the whole of heaven rejoices. And there's a party going on in heaven today. Don't worry about Father's Day, this is your day. And this is not about religion. Jesus said, I call you my friend. And so, Heavenly Father, right now, I just thank you for this precious daughter. What a wonderful thing that she comes to a Heavenly Father on Father's Day. And Father God, I ask right now that you touch her. That you'd help her to understand the fullness of the decision that she makes today. And that by your grace, Lord, she would. And so let's all pray with you together. To say after me, say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I ask you to come into my heart and set my free. Forgive me my sin. In Jesus' name. Amen. Actually, let's give the Lord a hand. Standing up. Clearly, he wants me to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and he has succeeded. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful message. And I know today's Father's Day. Remember, our church doesn't end until 12. So go and enjoy. Make sure to tell everybody who is a father happy Father's Day and enjoy some treats and go have some fun today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.